What I do is inconsequential. Why I do what I do is I get to shorten people's journeys every day. What I love about our hospitality industry is that it's our mission to make people feel cared for while on their journeys. Together, we'll explore what hospitality means in the built environment, in business, and in our daily lives. I'm Dan Ryan, and this is Defining Hospitality. Today's guest is an innovator, organizer, hotelier, industry leader, in-demand keynote speaker, founder of the Philadelphia Real Estate Council, and I'm a big fan of the Independent Lodging Congress, founder and managing partner of the Lenrock Group, Andrew Benioff. Welcome, Andrew. Thanks for having me, Dan. Appreciate it. It's so good to have you here. Number one, as a friend, I love talking to, to my friends, but also I love that so many of my friends are inspirations to me. And what you've created as far as my main interaction with you through the Independent Lodging Council, uh, uh, Congress, Independent Lodging Congress, and how you've really set a vision and touched upon all of the things that create hospitality, because it's not just hotels. Um, I'm just proud to be a part of it. And I am so grateful for the work that you are doing and have done. Thank you. That's very kind of you. Um, one of the reasons that I love doing uh, ILC Indie Congress is hearing that I'm able to, you know, um, inspire other people that it's lovely. Um, it's a really great feeling and uh, appreciate it. And you were on our advisory board for a number of years and loved having you on. And even when, while you've not been on the advisory board as you rolled off because of term limits, the, you've been uh, energetic in helping us and assisting in so many ways. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. And then I'm going to give the thanks right back to you because the first time I ever actually did an interview was with Marquise Stillwell at one of the, uh, at the Independent Lodging uh, Congress in um, Brooklyn. And mm -hmm. I, we did it with the cameras and everything. It was so much fun. And then you've given me the opportunity to do a lot of those um, Instagram live interviews. And it's kind of gotten us to where we are right now. So I also thank you as well. Amazing. I'm glad, I'm glad I can be of service. But it's also, and what I've seen and what a, be, a drum that you've beat, beaten with the Independent Lodging Congress too is um, we all get out of it what we put into it, right? And it's really like you have a vision and a, and, a, and a path you're on, but you're also open to feedback and, hey, that's a great idea, run with it. And I, and I appreciate that. And I have a feeling that that's going to uh, help define and spell out what your next well, my main question is for this on the podcast, but like, how do you define hospitality, Andrew? Well, um, for me, hospitality working, you know, I'm a long time. Uh, I spent a lot of time in the hospitality business in operations and finance. Uh, and uh, now I'm uh, part in, uh, in the ownership group in a number of uh, hospitality uh, properties and working on a number of others. And uh, for me, uh, you know, hospitality is partially defined by sort of what one of the things that Danny Meyer once said, actually at Indie Congress, and I'm sure he said it at other places as well. But he sort of he he, he took hospitality and service and 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 uh, bifurcated them and said that you know service is the act of serving, uh, you know, bringing over a cup of coffee or providing a guest room or bringing a guest luggage and so forth. But um, hospitality is the feeling that a um, empathetic uh, employee gives to the customer when um, they're interacting. And so, you know, it's that hospitality, you can have great service without hospitality. Um, it's difficult to have real hospitality without good service. Um, but but it's, it's really that, that feeling. And, and um, I think it's of utmost importance. Um, and, and then the second thing I, I think about a lot when I'm talking about hospitality or thinking about one of our projects or something that I'm involved in is something that I learned when I was at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel Company, which is a huge attention to detail. Um, and this doesn't necessarily, this isn't, I, I guess this is sort of part of defining hospitality, but it's not necessarily the, the actual uh, definition. But, but um, I think that that if you're a true hotelier and you're providing an experience, 
And it really doesn't matter what level of experience. It doesn't have to be a five star or five diamond experience like Chris Carlton offers. It could be four star, could be even three star. Um, and you can have true hospitality at any of these properties. Um, but that attention to detail is, I think, something that uh, a lot of a lot of owners and operators forget in the long run. And it's also a, it, it's a lot of work. And so I think people, um, you know, tend to maybe start off with their right, you know, uh, with that right intention, but then sort of drops off. So that attention to detail, I think, is of uh, paramount importance. So to hear that idea of an extraordinary attention to detail and to kind of push that together with this empathetic feeling and kind of pulling service out of it. Um, I heard you say that it's the, the, that attention to detail is very difficult, but in the conversations that I'm having and now that I'm really paying attention to all of this, sometimes those little bits of detail are not that difficult. It could be staying at a friend's house with an orchid next to your bed in the guest room or a bottle of water on a tray with a, with a napkin. Like there's just these little intentional touches that I'm hearing about from a lot of different people that are not actually difficult. And that's kind of an outcome of all of these conversations is, okay, we, we think that you have to be a Ritz Carlton or a Four Seasons, but there's so many of these little things that can make such a huge difference. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And you don't have to be a Ritz Carlton or a Four Seasons or a, a Rosewood or um, name any of the other luxury brands in hospitality. You don't have to be one of them. Uh, to have an extraordinary sense of uh, uh, attention to detail, excuse me. Um, and I, I think it's, um, it comes from the top down and I've worked for a lot of different general managers and a lot of different leaders. Um, and one thing that I've learned is that if the leader is invested, whoever that leader is then, and, and, and he or she can make that flow through down to the people that they work with and the people below them and so forth, you create a culture of attention to detail and hospitality. And when that leader doesn't do that, and then I think that um, you can see it. I just stayed in a hotel recently on a trip when dropping off um, a couple of my uh, children at, at college. And um, we stayed in a hotel in a major city in the Northeast. And it was a really cool, well-designed hotel. I thought the design was great, but there was a ton of things. I mean, a ton, a long list of items that were wrong, especially with the cleanliness of our room. Mm. And that's an attention to detail thing. And so I can tell you that, that um, if I went and interviewed that general manager, my guess is that didn't happen just the guest before me. There were a lot of things in that room that were uh, issues before I checked in and before the guest before me checked in. And the attention to detail goes to, do you have a preventive maintenance program? And are you, you know, are, are your housekeepers actually reporting when they see an issue in the room? Or is it just, ah, I'm just going to clean the room and get out of there. It, it, there's, there's a lot of little things that it goes into training and, and so forth. And so um, if you're passionate about hospitality and you're passionate about running a, a really amazing operation, no matter what level it is, you know, five, four, three, two, one star, it doesn't really matter. You can still pay attention and have that attention to detail for small things. And I think it's just really, really important. Um, I think as you were talking about that culture of detail and it brought me back to one of my, I don't know, top 10 experiences in the Bahamas, I stayed at this place in Harbor Island called the Rock House. And it's a small 10 room independent hotel, but the owner, I think his name was Don. I can't remember. I think, I don't remember, but uh, he would be around like making sure the pillows are right on the, on the sofa, making sure that everyone was cared for, but it was just like these little, little touches. And as you talk about detail, I'm also drawn to um, some of my best experiences of the delivery of hospitality. Like when I get a great omakase at, like Sushi Yasuda or something like that up, up in, in Manhattan. It's, the detail is so amazing. And I know that you shared with me that when you started your hospitality journey, you were an apprentice in Japan. And how much do you think that Japanese experience, well, first of all, tell us about that Japanese experience and, and how that may have influenced you. Because I'm hearing some great stories in our, of people in our industry that start at the bottom, whether it's a bellman or a uh, front desk and then worked their way up to general manager. And, you know, now you're in development. So I'd love to hear about that Japanese experience and how that may have influenced you. 
Sure. So I started, um, I spent about four and a half years in Japan when I was younger after college and um, started uh, like a lot of people did at that time, teaching English in Japan. And then I eventually um, decided I was really interested in hospitality and through some connections, I got a, uh, a formal apprenticeship at a, a small Japanese inn. And in Japan, you, uh, traditional Japanese inn are called Dokong. So I, I went to a, um, it was about a 15 room Dokong in Atami, Japan, which is, Atami is known for its hot springs. It's a resort town. And there are many, many Dokong in, in Atami. Some of them are 10 or 15 rooms all the way up to you know, 150, 200 room uh, Dokong. Usually, Dokkan are smaller. They're usually under 100. Matter of fact, they're probably mostly under 50 or 75 keys. Um, and uh, the, getting an apprentice position at one of these uh, type of inns is, is not easy. And I was in, in the entire city of Atami. I don't know how many people are in Atami, but um, I was the only foreigner that had a, um, uh, uh, an apprenticeship position. An apprenticeship there is sort of like a. Did they uh, call you Gaijin? Uh, they don't. They don't call you Gaijin. They call me by my name, but um, but I am Gaijin. Gaijin just means foreigner, a person who's not mm-hmm. Japanese, and so, um, th- you know, th- that kind of an apprenticeship. Even though I was paid, I was paid you know less than what is minimum wage here in the U.S. It's sort of like a a marginally paid slave position. You you work very very long hour. It was the hardest job I've ever had by far. Um, you know, we were probably working 13, 14 hours a day, uh, for, for, you know, not a lot of money and, um, or almost none essentially. And, um, got a break in the, you know, we started at 6 AM and we worked till probably 11 PM and got a break of a couple of hours in the middle of the day. And all I did during my break was sleep because I was so exhausted. Uh, but I did everything from, you know, cleaning toilets and, and bathtubs in, in rooms to making the bed in, in Japan uh, it, at our Ryokan, we didn't have any beds. We had uh, futon, which are the Japanese uh, sort of mattresses you roll out on, onto the, onto the floor. And, and so in, at a traditional Ryokan, you, you sleep in your room and, and you, you could, you could have very few, not that many people sleep with just two of you in the room, but, but often it's four or six of you. And for example, if you go with your business colleagues to a deal con for like, you know, a, for a, 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 re- a retreat to, you know, do team building, you go there to spend time together. So you literally, it would be, uh, I mean, if you can imagine, uh, Dan, you, me, uh, Marquise, Eric, Stephen, and Brigitte, we all go to the, to go to team building for ILC, they're literally checking us into one room. We change in that room. We usually probably go down to the hot baths downstairs, split into men and women, but you're all in the hot baths together. Uh, and by the way, all totally naked. Nobody, you, you know, if you wore a swimsuit or something in one of these hot baths, people would look at you very funny. Like, well, what, what are you doing? So you're all in there together. Uh, they're large baths, but it's super relaxing. It's great. And then by the time you come back up to the room, then you've taken a shower and you've cooled off and you're in like, you know, what's called a yukata, which is like a sort of a Japanese bathrobe. And then you come back up to your room and they've set out dinner and you all have dinner together in your room. Um, they, they lay out on little trays and you're sitting on the ground and it's wonderful. It's like a 14 course meal, um, which is fantastic. Um, and then when you're done with dinner, you might go back down to the hot baths or you go for a walk and they've cleaned up your dinner and they've laid out six futon in the room right next to each other we all sleep literally like sardines right next to each other in the room together um Mm. yeah and so it's a it's a very different cultural experience for for you know especially for westerners um ilc retreat 2022 or 2023 yes we should let's get get all let's get all those people to go yes we we should we should should absolutely do that would be fun um but in any case, yes. So, so, and I, I'm not sure there is another country on the planet. Uh, Germany is a close second, but but um, I don't think they hold a candle to the level. Uh, uh, going back to the attention to detail, the level of detail. And there's, by the way, there's good and bad parts of this. There's a lot of bad things. Japan is one of the most amazing countries I've ever been to. It's my favorite country on the planet. There's a lot of bad things about Japan as well as a ton of great stuff as well. It is the culinary capital of the world as far as I'm concerned. There is no higher level of cuisine, not only Japanese cuisine, 
I'm talking French and Italian and other cuisines in Japan. They, they do it to a level that, that most countries only, they might not even dream about the level that they, they look at, but their attention to detail in the country from when you start in kindergarten to all the way through to when you retire is unparalleled. So um, if you're interesting me, okay. on the, so on the good, the bad from the attention to detail, <clears throat> having lived in New York city um, during the rise of like the stereotypical Brooklyn maker, right? Where everything is artisanal from artisanal pickles to artisanal furniture to whatever. Um, <clears throat> it's this whole idea of love and craft that goes into that. But I feel just from my experiences with Japan, the entire country is artisanal. Like they invented the word artisanal or that that's like a core belief or value of theirs. And with that being said, <clears throat> how would you like, if you were to, if you were to share with us some of the really excellent attentions to detail um, that really maybe change your idea of how to deliver experience? Um, th th there are just, there are so many things. I mean, in Japan, from a small age, um, you're taught to care about others before you care about yourself. So it's really a mentality, their culture is a mentality of the, the well being of a group of people over the well being of an individual person. Um, and so you're constantly thinking about your coworkers, you're thinking about your family. Obviously, you think about yourself as well, but you think about them first always. And that goes into their service level. So even when you go to a McDonald's in Japan, the level of service at a McDonald's is better than at most hotels here in the US or a lot of hotels, not, not, not all. But you know, when, when you walk up to the front desk of a hotel here in the US and it's, uh, you know, Alex Cabanis is, is well, well known for sort of his, his, his TEDx talk that, um, that he did uh, that I hosted talking about the level of service. And, and, you know, when you walk up to the front desk, the first thing they see is they, when you're coming uh, across the, the lobby, they're, you're 10 feet away. And the first thing they say to you is checking in. So you know, it's, like, it, it, it's so lacking in hospitality. Um, yes, a person with a suitcase walking into the lobby somewhere between 4 p.m. and midnight, rolling their suitcase up to the front desk is likely checking in. But so I'm being facetious here, but what if they say your name three times in that process? Yeah, so <laughs> exactly. It doesn't solve the problem. So, you know, just ask me, checking in, that's not a greeting and it doesn't feel personal at all. So, you know, how about, you know, good evening. How are you this evening, sir? You know, um, how may I assist you? Or just, you know, hello, welcome to uh, the Pan Pacific Hotel. How are you tonight, sir? You know, or, or j just just a nice greeting and, and asking them how they are or, um, you know, how, how you can assist them would be lovely. And they're gonna come up and say, yes, I'm, uh, I'd like to check in. My name is Andrew Benio, whatever, it, whatever the case is. But the, the level of service, some of the simple things we get into this robotic you know, um, uh, way about us that we just continue to repeat things like checking in, checking out, you know, or, or, you know, or just not greet people. And it's infuriating because it just is a lack of culture, a lack of attention to detail. And even at, for example, going back to McDonald's in Japan, they, they welcome you when you come in and they are happy to be there. The, the, the service culture in Japan is being proud. Uh, whatever level of company you're working at, whether you're working at Japan Airlines, which is the, or, or ANA, the premier airlines of Japan, or the Hotel Okura in Japan, you know, a really, well-run um, uh, Western style hotel. The Hotel Nikko in uh, at Narita Airport is, a, is not even in the center of Tokyo, but they take pride in the job that they do there. And they're not always perfect, of course not, but even the smallest, even, even the person cleaning the rooms is really prideful of what they're doing and doing it to the best they can. And that's the culture of Japan, and I think that um, that none of them feel like, oh, this is below me, or, you know, uh, I should be, I should be doing. It. The, of course, they want to be promoted and they want to get more responsibility and so forth. But whatever level of they're they're at and whatever they're doing, they're putting their true heart into it and and paying attention to um, detail and, and putting aside their own personal feelings for the greater good. In this case, of the entity that they're working for and the team that they're working with. 
Mm. I when you when you said how difficult and and hard that apprenticeship was, and it was the hardest you've ever worked. And I think this has come up a couple times in conversations recently. I'm drawn back to that documentary Jiro Dreams of Sushi. I think that was the name of it, where there was one apprentice who would make tamago, which is the the omelet, and fold it. You'd have to fold it, get the heat just right, and all the ingredients just right. And for years, and finally, like after three or five years of trying to make the tamago every night, Jiro comes in and says, well done. And I think the guy started crying, if I remember correctly. But there was such a pride in working and and just getting to that point. Um, I'm hearing that come out of your story. Yeah, it, it, there's there's such a high level of detail and attention to detail and perfection in Japan that... Um, and once again, there's a good and a bad to this, and I'm not going into the bad right now, but the, the good of it is that you, you, you have a very uh, high level of either service or product that is produced. Um, mm -hmm. It's amazing. I've never seen it in other, you know, other countries. Um, and it has to do with the national culture, that's for sure. I remember when I was at the um, Gyokan in Japan, our head, the head chef and I worked in the kitchen there for about nine months or a year, I think actually. Um, and the head chef at the kitchen in the, in our kitchen was not a really old guy. He was, you know, sort of middle-aged, but, but very accomplished for his age. Um, and he was tough to work with. And I, as a foreigner, he let up on me a bit because uh, he couldn't expect as much from me because I was a foreigner, but there was a young kid who was, who was starting, who was above me as an apprentice. He was a full-time employee there, um, but still just learning. And um, he would, so in Japan, in your house, uh, the, the bath is called a furo. Um, and you, you usually heat the bath, you, you put hot water into the bath and heat it up. And then they put like a little, um, uh, like a, a couple planks of wood over the top to keep the heat in. And then when, the, when, the, when somebody gets in, they take those planks out and they get in the bath. Well, that's the, so the, 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 the um, it's like the lid on a, on a pot that, 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 mm -hmm. that, that, that uh, those planks of wood. So, but there's nothing more useless than those planks of wood when they're taken off because all you can use them for is keeping the heat in. But when you're not using the bath, they're just sort of useless pieces of wood in the corner. So he would, he would call this kid when he was doing stuff and it wasn't when he, he would ask him to, I don't know, peel carrots or uh, uh, get the lettuce cleaned or whatever he was doing, peel potatoes or mash them or whatever, whatever he was using for the food. If it wasn't done right, he would call him a lid on a bathtub, which meant that he was useless. And so it would, and over and over again, and this kid was working as hard as he could. Now, obviously there's a lot of, uh, you know, negative things. Uh, so yeah, was the HR department involved in that yeah, conversation? Yeah, there, there, is, there is no HR department there. So exactly. So it's, <laughs> so for here, people would be like, oh, you can't call me that. You can't do it. But of course, we also don't aspire to this, this level of perfection here in the United States, no matter what you say. I mean, yeah, there are some places that might, but um, so negative, there's negative parts of that as well, but this kid uh, eventually became an amazing chef and created amazing things. And it was only because of that hardship that he had to go through that he got there. And in Japan, that's part of the culture as well is going through hardship and accepting it, no matter how hard it is and persevering to get to this higher level and it's um, for good and bad. Once again, I, I sort of look at it both sides, but we don't really have that here in the US that much. There is some, there is some, but not at the level that you have it there in Japan. So on, on the good side of that, going from the apprentice and cleaning the toilets and helping out in the kitchen and working so hard to becoming a hotel manager in San Francisco, what are some of the, of the good parts? What inferred, like, what inspired you along your journey to become one of the managers at uh, the Hotel Nico in San Francisco? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I had management positions at the Pan Pacific in San Francisco, at Nico in San Francisco, and at Ritz Carlton in San Francisco. All amazing hotels. And one of the things that I think that going going from the beginning, cleaning toilets. Uh, uh, getting beds ready, checking in people, checking out people, dragging bags. I, 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 um, I managed the bell team and the, and the valet staff in, in, at the Nico in San Francisco. 
uh, checking in big groups of folks is I could really understand what all the, all of the folks that worked with me and for me were going through because I had done it all many many times myself. So that was of uh, hu you know a huge help to me and sort of empathetically connecting with them and they knew that I had done what they were doing and I also knew you know I knew what 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 how much they could do and what they couldn't do and tried to be very careful of asking too much of folks doing anything that I wouldn't be willing to do myself. So, you know, if we had a big group checking in, um, uh, you know, on a bus or something, and I had three doormen there or a bellman to take all, you know, the 80 bags off of the bus or whatever it was, I would hop down there and help them myself because I thought that that was important to, you know, when they're going through that hardship, I wanted to be a part of that with them. So I think that that is something that you, you, you definitely learn. And I think it's a valuable experience being able to go through it. No, you know, listen, nobody wants to clean toilets for the rest of their life, but at the same time in Japan, people take great pride in that. If they're the yeah. toilet cleaner, for example, if they're the person doing that or cleaning the hot, the, the, the hot spring bath below and, and scrubbing it out every morning for those guests, they take a lot of pride in that because they know that the guests are going to really have a wonderful experience there later. Um, it's not for everybody. Uh, hospitality is something that you, you either have or you don't. And, and uh, if you have it, it's something that hopefully you can, you can enjoy. The process. I think that's a great launching point because as you're speaking, I'm going back to originally where you were talking about Danny Meyer, how he bifurcated um, hospitality from service. And on the hospitality side, it was really that feeling of empathy, right? That that you can measure and a really empathetic person is gonna be very good at hospitality. And as you were telling the stories of checking in or cleaning toilets and you said, I wouldn't have anyone else do something that I wouldn't be willing to do. It's almost as if, and this has come up in conversations again, where in a hotel, it's really a, a, it's a standalone business where you can try out anything and really see if you can succeed or fail or what you like or don't like, but it's really what you bring to the table and it, and actually, as you're speaking, and as I'm hearing this and connecting the dots in my head, I really feel like that's a lot of the culture that you've brought over to ILC, because again, it's like, you're doing all of this, you're creating all these great little moments, but also it's open for anyone else to come in and, and help, help you drive the bus, so to speak. Yeah, I, I guess one of my philosophies in, in business, and why I enjoy being an entrepreneur is that I've learned over the years to be, I don't think I was this way in the beginning, but I've learned um, as I've gone along not to be fearful of, um, of uh, failure. And um, that that is, that's something that's, that, that if you don't try out new things, if you don't uh, explore new ideas, um, you sort of just have the same thing going on day after day, year after year, et cetera. And you never, never get to the next level or the next plateau, et cetera. So I think, I think it goes equally for the independent lodging Congress and what we do there, as well as in the, um, hotel and hospitality projects that I work on, you have to be constantly, uh, open to new ideas and creative and not fearful if something will, um, if something's going to fail. So you're walking down the road of your main business, your main business is the road, and you can see a couple of spurs going off to the left and right, or little little paths going off to the left and right, which are new I, possible new ideas. And I certainly let my team at the Independent Lodging Congress and others that I work with, I let them go and explore those little paths. I think you should. And some of them are going to just peter out into the woods and not go anywhere. That's failure. Okay drop it and move on. But some of them turn out to be, you know, fantastic ideas of new things that we ought to be doing. Um, and I mean, one of those is a, one of those is something that we're working on with you, Dan, which is the, your, your affiliation with the opportunity network and thinking of how we, how we connect underprivileged uh, minority uh, kids, you know, in college and high school to internship opportunities in hospitality where they, they don't have those connections. They've not grown up with those people, but, but we have lots of connections and how can we put hotel companies that need interns together with uh, a more diverse group 
uh, of both diverse racially, culturally, and experientially group of people that can add to their hospitality uh, operation. And that was something that was just a quick little spark of an idea. And you brought Brian Weinstein in, the, the founder of that. And then we talked about it and it's been sort of percolating for a little while, but I think it's now starting to coalesce and hopefully that's gonna, that's gonna produce something in the relatively near future of, of a really great opportunity for ILC to be able to give back and to connect with opportunity. Th that's just something that we explored and sort of thought about. And if you don't, you never have that opportunity for a new new venture like that. Well, and again, I think, thank you for that. And Opportunity Network is amazing and they're really making very impactful differences in kids' lives um, because talent is uniformly distributed, but opportunity is not. Um, and I think the more help that we can give to give anyone opportunity, it's wonderful. You're shortening other people's journeys. That's like why I get up every day. <clears throat> but what I will say with ILC for the, the congresses and the confabs and all these, the meetups that you have, and even on the advisory board, it's almost as if it's an open source code, right? It's not like you're, you're keeping other people out. You want to bring in speakers to inspire that might not have anything to do with hospitality but it gets us all thinking differently. Then we have these ideas and then we go out in the lobby and then our ideas, I've said this before, our ideas have sex with each other and they birth new little ideas and cool things come out of it. That's why it's like, you're, it's almost like you're an incubator for these ideas to collide, to create new things. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And that, that's one of the reasons that we, that we do uh, ILC and, and why we're interested is because of those really interesting conversations and the fascinating people we meet and, and hang out with. And by the way, all you know, those speakers who have nothing to do with hospitality, they may not, their business may not have anything to do with hospitality, but it's certainly something that if I wouldn't have them if I didn't think that there was an opportunity to use some of those ideas or there was a kernel of something that you could bring into hospitality. So if you continue to only look at the same businesses like most of the other conferences in hospitality do, they constantly have the same speakers, the same subject matter, um, and only people who are directly connected to the hospitality business, those are the only ones who go and are asked to speak. Then you have a full circle of you're going to be talking about the same stuff and never um, create something new. And for ILC, we believe that to, you know, independent hotels are the hardest type of hotels. You have to pay attention. You have to put more effort in because you're not in one way, choosing a brand is being lazy. You don't really have to think about it. That's why a lot of people put a brand on their thing. They don't want to have to, they don't want to go the hard route of constantly thinking about programming and experience and, and new ideas and who they're going to do in the restaurant. They'd rather just make it easy and put the brand on. They don't have to think about it. Um, and I get it. And that's, that's right for some deals and not right for other deals. But for us, exploring those new things is, I think, super important. And, um, the, I guess the last thing I'd like to say on that is for a long time, the word exclusivity has had a real, has a, had a really positive connotation in, you know, that it's like, you know, Hey, if I can join this exclusive club, I'm in with, um, with uh, everybody else. And, you know, you have to be, you have to be a member. It's exclusive. So not everybody's allowed. And that's love, you know, that's great. That's what I want to be part of. But the, the, the more I've spent time in business and definitely for ILC, we strive not to be exclusive. We actually try, strive to be inclusive. So, you know, to the extent we can, we want to invite others there, whether they are um, part of another brand. We have, we have some of the major brands uh, uh, as part of ILC as well, or they're fully independent or they're a, a construction or design firm or whatever, that you're all welcome to join us um, we're not the biggest by any means, but definitely we want to be inclusive and welcome other people in so that we have these conversations and, and come up with these new ideas and, and can increase our level of creativity. Because I also believe that ILC, as you've set it up and how you've structured the leadership and all the speakers, it's not a zero sum, it's not a zero sum game. It's all additive. We're all trying to get to that place where the independents are influencing the brands. The, in, the brands will teach things to the independents. You'll get outside speakers from music or fashion or entertainment that talk about their successes. And usually their successes have to do with 
their vulnerability and empathy or their serving others, which is all comes down to what we talked about as hospitality and it's transferable to anything. Yep, that's, no, that's exactly right. Transferable to anything. And I, that's, I'm a big believer in that. And, you know, I'm not gonna have, um, uh, we, we won't invite somebody who is, I don't know, talking about car tires, uh, on, you know, at ILC, because that's, uh, unless I found, you know, something that was directly attributable, but I might, I might, I might invite the designer of luxury vehicles they, you know, they design the interior of these luxury vehicles or a designer of uh, luxury cabins and airplanes to come and visit ILC and talk about the design process of that because mm -hmm. there are things that we could learn and maybe they flow over into the design of rooms and hotels or design of restaurant booths or uh, private dining rooms or anything else in, in hospitality. So I, I, I think it's, um, there are things that are sort of disparate uh, fields that, that do have connection to what we're doing. Um, we probably spend, and I probably spend way too much time curating the panels um, and the discussions that we have at ILC. Uh, I don't think, I think most of the major other larger conferences in hospitality spend very little time. And I, and I say this to a lot of people, they say, you know, they ask me, what's the difference between what you do and, you know, I'm not going to mention the names of those larger conferences, but you know the, the the other conferences. And I say, well, if you look at those other conferences and you look at the the titles of the panels and the panelists on those conferences, and I show you an agenda from 2020, 2015, 2010, and 20, 2005, and I take off the years, I bet you can't tell me when those happened or the difference between those events because they're essentially the same, same people, same discussions. Um, which is too bad because I think you're really losing an opportunity to learn and, and uh, evolve the industry, which is what we want to do. Well, the curiosity, uh, the culture of curiosity that you've created and the ability for people to kind of get outside of their normal network has been amazing and just inspiring for me. Um, I want to go back to uh, from your Japanese experience as far as some of the worst deliveries or the, the, those worst details. And when you think about those bad details that from your experience in hospitality, how have they uh, propelled you into a different direction? Um, can you, can you, um, I'm a little unsure what you mean by worse details. So you, um, you were saying that there's the good details okay. and the bad details. The so I'm just, the bad. Okay. and I, I didn't want to go into the bad before, but you know, I want to use that now as, okay, well, that was bad or shocking or not cool. And this is, it's actually helped propel me in a different direction. And I've learned from that much in the same way that you're like, don't feel failure. It may have been a terrible experience, but it, it will inform a, a trajectory Fair for enough. you. In yeah, your no, life. I understand. I understand. Yeah. So I would say one of the things is that um, in Japan, um, change is not something that they, uh, that J the Japanese culture comes to very easily. Um, and so they they do things in the same way and the way that they've been doing it. And Japan has a very, very old culture. So I'm not talking about like 100 years or 200 years. We're talking, you know, hundreds, maybe even more than a thousand years of uh, doing things in, in a certain way. And so um, even though Japan, Japan is an interesting culture because it's definitely a first world country for the most part in a city like Tokyo or Osaka, but the other you know, out in the country and in some of the other ways that they do, they live their lives and do business, they're like a third world country. So it, it, it's a really interesting dichotomy of um, how they live there. So, so the, the inability to change quickly, the inability uh, is something that I think, you know, is a, is a, a downfall um, and something that, um, you know, would be useful for them to look at. So they, they don't change or uh, create new things very quickly. So, you know, if you have, oh, something happened and we now have to change, it's hard for them to not do the, th it, even though there's an issue for them to change out of the way that they've always done things is, is very difficult for them. And often they won't, they'll still continue to do sort of the same thing, unfortunately. And how have you taken that observation to fuel your path? Yeah, I think, I think it's um, exactly what I've, what we talked about with, um, uh, looking at the different uh, branches off the main road that I'm going down and and exploring, but but um, trying to be open to uh, it, it's okay to be open to failure. And when I when I get there, 
uh, uh, something that I learned more in hospitality in, in the US, especially at uh, Ritz Carlton. Um, I worked for a, um, a, a difficult, you know, very difficult a person who was very difficult to work for, with, work for, excuse me, but, but an extremely effective uh, manager, um, good and bad working for him. Um, he unfortunately used fear as a motivator, which wasn't, I didn't think was the best way to do it, but he was also super effective at what he did. And, and one of the things that he sort of showed us was, you know, like if you have an issue and we don't have the, the proposed solution for it right now, it doesn't really matter, figure it out. And we, we, we had carte blanche to uh, spend money, not, you know, not go crazy, but spend money or figure out what the solution is and do it quickly. Um, because, you know, guest satisfaction and guest experience was of, of paramount importance. So learning to sort of get out of that box of, oh, this is the way we do things. And we can't do that. I, I can't tell you how many times I've had people who work for me, but also experiences when I go to a hotel and I ask for something that is not a difficult thing. And people say, no, that it's not our policy to do that. Or no, we can't do that. And it shouldn't be that difficult to figure some of these things out, um, especially when they're uh, with, when they're within the power of the employer or whoever's, whoever's dealing with it. Try to be more flexible in your thinking. Try to be uh, a little bit softer and say, okay, we don't normally do it this way. Let me see how I can figure this out. Um, and and uh, there, was, there was a time at the, at the Nico San Francisco when we had a guest come to us. We had a small gift shop in the, in the uh, hotel, but it was run by a, a separate vendor. So it wasn't actually a hotel employee and the business was, they were just renting from us. And we had a guest go down there and wanted to buy cigarettes and put it on his room account. He didn't have cash, but since it was a separate business, the employee down there had no way of putting it on the room account. Um, and so, you know, that, that employee told the guest, I'm sorry, we can't charge you the room account. You have to pay with either a credit card or cash here. It's separate. And that the, the guest went absolutely ballistic. I mean, literally started to scream was totally red in the face, was practically spitting on her because he was just so angry. Yeah. And I, it's kind of like that whole battle between having a policy or a, like a guideline, right? Right. And how exactly do you right. be flexible about it? Right. Exactly. No, exactly right. So, so I, I, uh, I, um, as the manager, got the guest, got him settled down, understood, said, hey, here's cigarettes from the, the take the cigarettes, they're yours. Don't worry about it. They're they're on the hotel. You don't even have to pay for them. Not much mm -hmm. less, but and if you want more later, let me know and I'll get them onto your room account. No problem. And then I went and took a, out of uh, petty cash, whatever it is, fifteen dollars, and paid the gift shop. And I said, next time if the guest does that, come up to the front desk. We'll put it on their account. We'll pay you out with the thing. And we didn't have any. There was no policy to do that up until that time. And I yeah. said, great. I'm making the policy. Here it is. It's not that difficult. It was an easy fix. Nobody was losing out. We just didn't have a policy and, and employees get very, they're worried they might, you know, lose their job if they don't have the right, you know, if they don't have the, what, you know, if the, if what they sell doesn't match what's in the till and mm -hmm. there's, you know, all sorts of issues. And, and I understand that the employee was, was fearful of that. And then the guest doesn't understand it at all. They just want a smooth experience. They're like, I don't care about any of this other stupid stuff. Give me my freaking cigarettes and put it on my, <laughs> put it on my bill. So yeah. You You're really speaking my language on that one because resistance to change or change in particular dovetails into one of my five core values, which is adapt and improve. And we, you know, that, as one of our five core values, like that's how we give feedback, we give praise, we give criticism, we hire, we fire based on adapt and improve. We, we must be that as an, entre as an entrepreneur. Absolutely. Got to do it. Got to do it. So yeah, no, I think it's, I think it's important. And so that, that's uh, going back to your, your original question. That's one of the things that I think is a negative point that I, that I learned in Japan, but it also helped propel me to a new way of thinking and, and has made me more flexible today, which is good. Well, and also if you think about that resistance to change and doing things the way that they were done forever, it's also helped them get so deep into making the perfect tamago or, or make, or, making the, the perfect mashed potatoes or whatever, whatever it is, it's going deep. You, you, you get to that super, I don't know, nuanced level of artisanal. I just made that. Uh, up. Uh, absolutely. And by the way, if you like, um, if you liked uh, uh, Jiro dreams of sushi, which is a fantastic 
that mirrors my experience in Japan exactly, by the way. I did a lot of that and worked in that exact same environment. Um, and uh, if you'd like another suggestion of another Japanese movie um, that I, or a movie about Japan, excuse me, that I thought was fantastic, it's called The Birth of Sake. Ooh. And it's about a uh, d sake distiller in Japan and they're, it's about one season of, uh, they're, they're one of the last handmade, fully handmade, not automated sake distillers in Japan. And it's an amazing movie. It came out, uh, I don't know, three, four years ago. Oh, wow. Right, I'm definitely going to add that to my list. It's fantastic. You'll love it. If you like Jiro Dreams of Sushi, I think you'll love it. Great. I I'm going to definitely watch that. Now, staying with that um, metaphor of change or the idea of change and going through our going back into our industry and kind of what we've been through with the pandemic and what we're still going through outside of the pandemic and where we are and all the things that are happening now in real time, what's keeping you up at night as far as things to adapt to or not adapt to right now. And you said outside of the pandemic? Outside of the pandemic, yeah. Yeah, um, wow, that's a hard question because right now, at least for me, for ILC, uh, this Delta variant is really on our minds and that seems to be affecting us a lot. Um, outside of that, I'm, I'm very interested personally in um, travel that connects us to nature and wilderness. And so I've been focused on um, uh, development in that area and looking at those kind of projects. I'm also really fascinated by the tiny house movement here in the US mm. and across the planet um, and how that can play a part. And I think that um, because of COVID, certainly, but eventually when we're past COVID, I think it will still be of uh, really strong interest for a lot of people. People are exploring, certainly here in the US, more US locations that, that can connect them to nature so that they can, they can disconnect and really experience it, but also be comfortable. And there are lots of different monikers. A lot of people call that glamping, but there are other, there are other forms of hospitality that are not necessarily glamping, but there, there are lots of different forms that that takes and a lot of great companies that are exploring it in, in their own different ways and their own distinct formats, which I think is lovely. And um, I've used this time of difficulty to explore it for myself and to work on a project that I'm, that I'm noodling on, which has been wonderful. Wonderful. And bringing it back to Japan as well, I've been reading a lot. I haven't done this yet, but this idea of nature bathing as well and, and how it kind of reinvigorates the human mind, body, and spirit. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, one of the great things, J Japanese culture is based on seasons. Everything has to do it. Matter of fact, in, you know, in traditional Japanese homes, um, the, the art on the walls is changed four times a year to reflect the seasons, as well as, mm -hmm. as, well as like flower arrangement and other things. So the food is as well. Everything is extremely seasonal. Um, you, you know, you, you're not eating uh, pineapple in the winter in Japan. It's just, it's not, you, you eat things that, you eat fruits and vegetables and fish and meat that is based on the seasons. What is good in that season? And so there are certain things you just, you don't eat in the winter that you would have in the summer. Um, and I think that that's um, an amazing part of the culture. Really great. Awesome. And then what's exciting you most about the future? So let's say Delta variant, we're moved past, you're, we're doing all this nature, tiny house stuff. Um, What's exciting you most about what's out there? I, I just, I, I, the longer I've done ILC, the more I've become interested in, in indie hospitality and indie hotels. And um, I think that the indie space is fascinating for so many reasons in that, you know, it takes so much more attention to detail to work on one of those projects. And it also takes so much more of a connection to the community and the area that the project is in. And so I'm working on a number of different projects that are all indie focused. And I, I just, I love them because each one of them is so distinct and different. And I love, I love that focus of really digging into the community. I think a lot of hoteliers don't want to deal with that. Don't want to think about it. They'd rather just uh, put a uh, Holiday Inn or a Hyatt Place or a, a Fairfield Inn or a Hampton Inn or, um, 
whatever flag on a property, build it, get the management team in there and forget it and collect the check. And I get it. Uh, and that's cool. You, that, that's, that works for that person. But I actually want to spend the time and effort and really dig into the community and understand what's going on and uh, how, that, how that hotel or hospitality project fits in there. And, and spend the time tweaking it and figuring out stuff and failing at certain things and recreating them and, and trying to understand it. I think, I think that that's a fascinating uh, uh, experience and, and that's what I enjoy doing. So that's what I'm working on. Wonderful. At the beginning of the pandemic, I had a conversation, a couple of conversations with Horst, Horst Schulze, like, who was like a founder of Ritz Carlton. And he, repeatedly said that once we get through this and once this is over this the pandemic this will be the time for independent hotels he really he said it was from such like a a visceral belief and i really want to get him on here to just kind of pull on that thread a little bit more i mean he said it over and over this is the time for independence well for those of us who worked at ritz carlton we call him mr schultze um and i could never call him i i was not at the level at Ritz to call him Horst or Horst Schultze. So uh, I had the pleasure of um, escorting Mr. Schultze once when he was at the Ritz Carlton in San Francisco to his room and around the hotel a little bit and spent a little bit of time talking with him. And he's an absolute inspiration and um, he bleeds hospitality. There is nobody who I've ever met who just being with them in the room, you feel like he is you know, his sole care is the guest and the guest experience and how things affect them. And it was an absolute inspiration for the very short, and he will never remember me, I know that, but um, for the very short time that I, that, you know, 30 minutes or an hour that I spent with him one day at the Ritz-Carlton in San Francisco was just amazing. Great guy. Amazing. Yeah. He was, I call him Horst because he was introduced by, a, uh, I was introduced to him by a friend, Michael Bedner, who just known him forever. And I don't know how many Ritz Carlton's he's designed, but it was just a very friendly intro. But all of those things that you just said transcend to my mother-in-law, who was actually working at the Ritz Carlton Half Moon Bay as a concierge for a long time. And all of those things that you just described, they came through her, right? She really heard that. That culture just kind of lived on way past Horst's, Horst's involvement in um, Ritz Carlton. Absolutely. And I was Schultz. on the opening team. I was on the opening team for the Ritz Carlton Half Moon Bay, which is an amazing property. While I was at San Francisco, I was sent down as a task force manager on the team and uh, amazing, amazing property. And I have a picture um, in my office, actually, of myself and my wife and our firstborn standing outside the Ritz Carlton Half Moon Bay. So that's a great memory. Oh, Thank great. You. Was someone playing bagpipes while you were standing there? They weren't, but it looks like every, when I show people that picture, they, everybody says, where were you, Scotland? Or Ireland, yeah. and I say no. That's in that's the Ritz Carlton Half Moon Bay. It looks like that. It looks like it's such a it's such an amazing place. And um, when that when that fog rolls in, when Carl the fog rolls in, it is just yep. amazing. So eerie. And yeah, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful property. If you get to go, yeah. awesome. Um, when you're traveling, and I know you haven't been traveling as much, but when you're traveling, what's something that makes you feel at home? What do you miss the most? Uh, that's a, that's a really great question. Um, I, I think really the, the thing that I miss the most whenever I'm traveling is a good bed because so many times just we we're on our trip this past time out of the five nights we were away, four of those nights, we had not great beds and I, it, it's, it's suffering, not comfortable. And I wake up in the morning and I'm tired. And the last night that we were, uh, that we stayed, uh, we, we had a really lovely bed. And just that, that great sleep that I got from the wonderful sheets and the firm, I'm a firm mattress guy, I don't like it too soft. So that firm mattress, maybe there's like a feather top mattress topper, but it was, the mattress was firm and we got in and I was just like, oh, finally a good bed. And I woke up the next morning and I was totally refreshed. That was, that was just wonderful. That was just wonderful. But I will tell you that coming back to our little town here in Eastern Pennsylvania, Southeastern Pennsylvania, outside of Philadelphia, that's very green and our little, our house is not grand and it's not fancy. Um, but just being here with 
and listening to the birds chirp and um, it's very quiet where we are is just lovely. Never, never, never gets old coming home. You'd think that, well, for me, from my experience, when I'm in a hotel, I'm spending, you know, I'm not in the room very much, but I'm spending 75 to 95% of my time sleeping. You'd think that there would be more effort put into the beds. Yeah, uh, for anything that I do, my focus, anything that I'm developing or investing in, my focus is on two main areas for the room um, and they have to be superlative. Everything else can be great and well-designed and whatever, um, and they have to work well and stand up to you know, a lot of use. But the two things that have to be you know, at the highest level, and it doesn't mean they have to be made out of gold or marble or silk, they just have to be comfortable, work well, is one, an amazing bed with amazing sheets. That's number one, has to be. And then number two is an amazing shower with good water pressure. Those two things, if they work well, they solve a lot of the other ills in a hotel, as far as I'm concerned. And when they don't work well, ugh, what a terrible stay. Yeah. Um, how old were you when you started and finished your apprenticeship in Japan? Oh, gosh. Uh, I was um, in my mid-20s. So early 20s to mid-20s is when I, uh, it was probably like 23 to 26 or something, I forget. Okay, so range. I'm teleporting you right now back to Japan. You're standing in front of your 26-year-old self. What advice do you give yourself? Oh, boy. Uh, be patient and have an open mind um, because I was very focused on doing, you know, one thing this is I, this dream and I wanted to do this. And I was very, you know, I didn't, didn't have a lot of, in my mind, there weren't as many options. I wasn't as open-minded or patient. And so I sort of went down one path and it was good. And I got a lot of great experience and it's turned out to be okay. But I think having a little bit more of an open mind and not deciding this is the, this is the one way things need to go. Um, and, and, letting things come, giving things a try. If it doesn't work out, trying something else, that's okay. I think it's almost more important. This is uh, advice that I give to a lot of mentees that come to me for advice, which is it's almost more important to know what you don't want to do uh, than it is to know what you do want to do. Um, because a lot of people come and they're not sure what they want to do. And I say, great. Well, do you want to be a nuclear scientist? And they say, nope. I said, good. That's one thing we've crossed off. Uh, you know, do you want to be a race car driver? Nope. Uh, okay, another thing we've crossed off. So try to try to try to have a general area you think you want to get into, but just because you want to be in commercial real estate or just because you want to be in hospitality doesn't mean you need to know today what part of it you want to do. Give it a try. Try one thing, and it's okay. It it'll tell you whether you like that or not. And some of the things, certainly when I started, some of the things that I tried didn't work out and things that I thought I'd be good at, I wasn't. And things that I thought I wouldn't be good at, I was great at. So um, it, it's a lot of experiment, experimentation. I think there's a lot of pressure on young people today to know exactly what they wanna do and they're pigeonholed. And I think that they're given a lot of pressure by their parents, which is unfortunate. Yeah, it, 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 what you're saying right there ties in perfectly to that, what you said earlier is don't, feel, don't fear failure. Cannot feel failure. I totally, agree. even when you're young, and especially when you're young, I mean, you, it's, it's the time to fail and try and figure stuff out. And generally it, it works out. And I know, I know I, I'm coming from a place of privilege and I had a bit of a backstop because of my family situation and some people don't have that um, ability. So I totally get that. Um, but it still doesn't mean you, I'm not saying you should work for free and, you know, not earn a salary. No, get a job, try it. And it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be your last one or you have to do that. So just because somebody told you you should be an accountant because there are a lot of people who are accountants, great, get a job as an accountant and try it. And you may hate it. And if you do like it, great, keep going. And if you don't like it, while you have the job, look for something else and try something else. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. That suffering can be very illuminating, right? If, Absolutely. Just, the, the point is just get out there and do it. And <clears throat> One of the, uh, uh, an important signpost in my life is, you know, I was in the middle of failing and uh, I was on a bus and there was this woman sitting in front of me. She had a t-shirt that said, failure is just unfinished learning. 
And it reframed the way I looked at it. And failure is an incredible teacher. Well, a friend of mine told me this, and I'm not sure if this is his quote or not. It might not be his quote. I think he might have gotten it from somebody else. But he said, um, which I always love this quote, it's, it's a definition of experience. And he's always said that experience is what you get when you don't get what you want. So I, I love that. Um, and and uh, so, you know, you may not get the job that you wanted when you, when you started, but you got a good experience in, in trying it out. Um, and then you got to keep trying something. And uh, that's how you build up your experience. There's a lot of failure, a lot of things that necessarily weren't perfect, but that's okay. Give it a try. Because if you try sometimes, you might find you get what you need. <laughs> yes. Rest in peace, Charlie Watts. <laughs> right on. Um, <clears throat> Andrew. Yes. Andrew, where can people find you? Uh, they can find me. Most of my stuff on social media is, uh, so, I mean, I have, I have accounts on, you know, all the major social media things. The best one would be um, on LinkedIn. Uh, you can find us at ilcongress.com. Uh, stands for independent lodging, ilcongress.com. But we're also on Instagram, um, Facebook, LinkedIn, and I have personal accounts there too. Feel free to reach out. Always happy to chat. Great. And I think your LinkedIn is uh, Lenrock Group Benioff as well. Uh, that might be. But if you just type my, there's only, I don't think there are any other Andrew Benioffs. So if you just okay, type great. my name in, you'll find me. Awesome. And then uh, everyone, I, I highly suggest you check out um, Independent Lodging Congress on Instagram. There's so much great content and recorded conversations from a bunch of like top leaders in the hospitality industry. And Andrew, that whole library of content that you've created is just amazing. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff. It's all on the website. We have, um, we have almost 30 uh, podcast episodes and we're going to do, be doing more going into 2022. Um, and then we have, uh, I don't know, 125 or 150, something like that, IG live interviews, and then a bunch of other video interviews. It's all on the, all accessible on the website. Wonderful. Andrew, thank you very much. I'm so grateful for your time and your friendship. Thanks very much, Dan. It was really a pleasure. Um, I appreciate you having me on uh, and I look forward to chatting again soon. Wonderful. And also thank you to our listeners. I hope this talk has evolved your view on how to deliver hospitality. Uh, I sure learned a lot today about Andrew and it's influenced how I'm thinking about things now. So thank you everyone. And we'll see you next time. <music>